So today we will be discussing a recently published paper titled The Effect of Relative Encoding on Memory-Based Judgments by Marissa Sharif and Daniel Oppenheimer. Now I want to start by saying I'm a huge fan of these authors, and they have been doing a lot of really cool work lately. Plus, I think you'll really be able to relate to a lot of their findings that they talk about today. Now, the authors start off by discussing how research has shown that we are bad at identifying or estimating the absolute magnitude or total quantity of a stimulus but we are very good at discriminating stimuli from one another. For example, it's pretty difficult for people to accurately identify the number of dots within a given pattern, but we are very good at figuring out which pattern has more dots. Now, this finding is really interesting because it demonstrates how quickly and how efficiently we can make some judgments but not others. For instance, if I quickly show you this image and ask you to tell me how many dots were in pattern B, you may not be able to do this very fast. However, if I quickly present you with the same image, but ask you to tell me which figure had more dots, you should be able to tell me that figure B had more dots than figure A. Now, related to this point, other researchers have shown that when assessing a stimulus, people represent where in the distribution that stimulus lies, rather than the absolute value of that stimulus by making either an ordinal judgment or an internal judgment. Now, the differences between these judgments are subtle and may be difficult to keep separated, but I think they're incredibly interesting because an ordinal judgment refers to the idea that people can determine that one stimulus is better than another, but not by how much. Whereas an interval judgment suggests that people can determine how much stimuli differ from one another in relative terms, but not in relation to absolute standards. Now, essentially, what this information is saying is that people's evaluations are heavily influenced by surrounding stimuli. Now, to further demonstrate this, to further demonstrate that people's evaluations are heavily influenced by surrounding stimuli, we can look at a commonly used circle illusion within psychology. Now, this illusion is awesome because it demonstrates that despite the orange circles being the exact same size, the circle on the right looks much larger than the circle on the left. This is because we tend to judge circles as being smaller when they are surrounded by larger circles. Now, the takeaway from this is that our judgments are often informed by relative information, such as the surrounding circles, rather than absolute information, such as the exact size or the actual size of the orange circles. Now, although our judgments are often informed by relative rather than absolute information, there are often times in which we must make decisions without the help of readily available information. Put simply, it is not uncommon for our judgments to rely on our memories of past information. Now, interestingly, prior research has shown that when we rely on our memories to help us with the given decision, we rely on our initial impressions of those past evaluations. Now, this tends to be much more efficient than recalling the details of a past evaluation and then reevaluating all of our options. Now, the authors wisely point out that if our judgments are relative rather than absolute, and if we rely on our initial impressions of stimuli, then do our evaluations of prior stimulus change after we acquire new relative information? Now, the authors discuss a great example that I think perfectly sums up their research question in a way that I'm sure you'll be able to relate to. Now, imagine that there's a college student who eats mainly dorm food. However, the student is able to occasionally go out and eat at a local pub. Now, compared to the dorm food, the pub food is among the best food the student has ever had. Now, eventually, the student graduates and is exposed to a variety of great food, which is likely to be better than the food served at the pub. Now, given this exposure to new, better food sources, how would the student recall the quality of the pub food? Now, to try and answer this question, the authors conducted a series of studies. In the first study, the researchers had participants listen to several song clips at two different times, and then make evaluations of who they thought was the best singer and who they thought was the worst singer. Now, I think the author's methodology in this first study is fascinating, because in this study, the researchers had two very bad singers, three average singers, and two very good singers. Now, participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions, 
And this is where things really start to get cool, because in the first condition, the researchers called it the T1 top condition, and they had participants listen to two bad singers, and then they listened to a good singer. In the second condition, which they called the T1 bottom condition, the participants listened to two good singers, and then they listened to an average singer. Now, the reason why I think this is so interesting is because the authors use this methodology to make the average singer look relatively good or bad by comparison. Now, after listening to these individuals, the participants completed a distractor task, and then they listened to two more average singers, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they were told to select one singer as the winner, and to select one singer to be eliminated. Now, what the authors found in this first study is really interesting, because as you can see in this graph, when the average singer was paired with a bad singer, such as the T1 top condition, the average singer was frequently selected to be the winner. However, when the average singer was paired with a good singer, such as in the T1 bottom condition, the average singer was frequently selected for elimination. Now, the fascinating thing about these results is that they demonstrate that the evaluation of the average singer depended on his or her evaluation or relative comparison to either the good or bad singers, and our initial relative evaluation of a given stimuli do not change even after we are presented with new information, such as the presence of additional average singers. Again, these findings are pretty straightforward, but the manner in which the authors tested this question is really clever. Now, in the second study, the researchers had participants watch a toy car race along the track at two different times, and then make evaluations about which car they thought was the fastest. Now, the authors tried to test their question in another unique way, and I think this approach to asking their question is much more interesting in the second study, and even better than what it was in the first study. Now, in this study, the participants, or excuse me, the researchers had the participants look at three different cars consisting of a slower red car, a faster yellow car, or a moderate speed black car, which they call the target car. Now, similar to the first study, participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions in which they either saw the moderate car race the slow car, again the T1 top condition, or they saw the moderate car race the fast car in the T1 bottom condition. Again, the reason for doing this was to make the moderate car look relatively fast when racing the slow car, or relatively slow when racing the fast car. Now, after watching the two cars race along the track, the participants then completed a distracted task and were then asked to watch a final car race along the track, which was actually the same moderate black car. And this is what's really cool about this study, because despite being told that it was a different car, it was the exact same moderate speed car as they saw before, and they called this the decoy car. Now, the participants were asked to, after the distracted task, the participants were then asked to rank the three cars according to their speed. Now, again, the authors were able to find another really interesting effect in this study. And as you can see in this graph of the second study, when the moderate speed car was paired with the slower car in the T1 top condition, the participants rated it as being the fastest. However, when the moderate speed car was paired with the faster car in the T1 bottom condition, it was rated as being the slowest. Now, the really great thing about these results is that they also demonstrate that our evaluation of a given stimulus such as the speed of a toy car, is dependent on our earlier evaluations. Now, overall, I'm pretty impressed with how the authors were able to find such consistent results across these two really impressive studies. Now, in their third and final study, the authors had participants record the number of butterflies that landed on certain flowers. Now, a really unique aspect of the study is that these butterflies and flowers were not real, but instead were aspects of a computer gram a computer program, which in my opinion, it was a really clever idea. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the specifics of this study, but I should point out that the results for study three were essentially the same as the results found in both study one and study two, such that participants tended to rely on their memory to make relative judgments. Now, the fact that the results were consistent across the three studies really goes to show that the author's manipulations were well thought out or were very appropriate for the questions that they were asking. Now, as we discussed earlier, prior research has shown that people encode information relative to the context and 
When making judgments from memory, people rely on their initial impressions. That being said, I think it is fascinating that the current study was able to demonstrate that people rely on their initial evaluations of a given stimuli, even when contextual information has changed with times too. Now, in three separate experiments, people encoded information relative to the context of time one. For example, an average signal was presented with either a very good or a very bad signal in time one, or a moderately fast car was paired with either a slower car or a faster car at time one. Impressively, across all three studies, the authors found that participants would not update their decisions or their evaluations after being given new relative information. Now, specifically, the average singer was seen as being the best when initially compared to the bad singers, but was seen as being the worst when initially compared to the good singers, despite being presented with additional information later. And furthermore, the moderately fast car was seen as being the fastest when initially compared to the slow car, but was seen as being the slowest when initially compared to the fast car, despite being presented with the same moderately fast car later. Now again, I think it is fascinating that the authors were able to find such interesting effects using these simple, simplistic, but really creative methods. Now, in sum, when making memory-based judgments, we tend to rely on the context in which the original stimuli was encoded. Now, because of this interesting finding, it is important that we are aware of this bias because our initial evaluations may bias how we encode later information. Given that many of our judgments are based on memory, it is imperative that additional research use similar effective methods to try to understand how and why people make biased judgments in this situation.